and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The, the scrolls of the prophets of Isaiah was re- handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Thank you, John. It's good to see all of you today. Most of you have a day off tomorrow. Some of you have every day off, so it's not going to seem like a holiday, but uh, try and take it as a holiday anyway, as a special day when you get to go do something. Uh, So that's always a good thing. Uh, A couple of new things coming up. We're trying to take pictures and put them on our picture board so everybody knows who you are. So if you are not on the tree out there, which is now covered up, have your picture taken today. They will be next week down in the, in the fellowship hall where the Spanish meet. And so either today, if you don't think you look good today, then try next week again. Uh, new quarter has just started. I hope you were able to attend some of the classes today. And uh, new classes will be going on Wednesday night. Our summer series is finished, but they're will be a music class, and so this is teaching how to read music and how to be able to sing. Uh, My class is going to be rising to the challenge, and then Honor is going to be doing a ladies' class. These three remain, and so I'd encourage you to attend one of those classes, and especially if you have kids, bring your kids. They need to be knowing what this stuff is all about. We... uh, started at the beginning of the year with the theme to seek Jesus, to find Jesus, and to share Jesus. And at the beginning of the year, we had a whole lot of thoughts about seeking Jesus. And a lot of churches, that's where they end. We want to seek Jesus. We want to find people who are seeking Jesus. And uh, let's seek Jesus some more. And let's always be looking for Jesus and always be seeking him. Did you find anything? I didn't hear any yes. So uh, let me share with you some things that we might find as we find Jesus. So hopefully we're open to people who are seeking Jesus, but it's not just that we want to be continually seeking and never finding Because you can't share a Jesus that you have not found. And so I want you to be thinking about what have I found about Jesus that is, here is the the core of what I know from, from Jesus. And so we want to talk about that a little bit today. The world doesn't have much respect for Scripture. But I want to talk about what Scripture is to us and the way that this works. Because I think Jesus is found in Scripture. Uh, The Bible is written by about 40 different writers over a period of about 1,600 years, and they did a lot of research. Some of them just got visions. Some of them went and talked to other people. Some of them, it seems like it's, you know, God told me this, and some of them it's, well, I think I'm inspired, and uh, sure enough, they are, but uh, it doesn't always seem like they're um, aware of what's happening and, and yet we find God uses theirs, and, and we know that God was, was giving them these words. It's not a book about heroes. It's a book about faith. And many of the heroes were the ones that are people of faith. There's a lot of people of prophecy there who were able to see visions, who were prophets in Israel. And they were used to prophets back then. They were used to going to someone who is a man of God and and saying, well, okay, does God think I'm okay? Is he going to let me win the battle? Because I really want to win this battle, but if God says you're not going to win, I'm not going to go fight. Well, some of them decided, you know what? No, God says you're not going to win the battle. So they put on a disguise 
and said, well, I think I'll win the battle if I wear this disguise. There's all kinds of things in here about how we see God and about the way in which we do this. But sometimes we reduce it to, it's just a book that I carry, so that when the preacher says, did you bring your Bible today? Everybody holds up their phone, right? <laughs> it's easier that way. I mean, that's, that's what I do too. I bring mine because then I can check references and everything else. And so, But there's a lot of things that are like that. God never just intended it to be something that you carry. He intended it for something that is written on your heart. And that's really what the Word of God is to be, not just for something that you carry around to prove your credential as a Christian. It's a book more about mistakes and failures than it is victories, but yet it's more about grace and repentance than it is failure. And we find in that people win. And so the passage we're looking at today in Luke chapter 4 is one where Jesus goes back. He's just begun his ministry. He's 30 years old. And at 30 years old, you know everything. I mean, there are no questions. You know how to do everything that there is. And so he starts out at 30 years old, and he goes and he starts preaching and he starts doing miracles. And he goes to his hometown as one of the first places. Because after all, if you're going to go tell people about the gospel and about who you are, where would you go? And we find that a lot of times people will go back to where they grew up or to their hometown. So he goes to Nazareth, and he goes and he sits in his normal pew, right? Isn't that where you're sitting now? It's the place where you always sit, and it's back to the same synagogue that he was in before, the same place. They look over and go, oh, there's where Jesus is sitting, because he always sits right there in this and you always knew where he was going to sit. And they had people get up, and so he gets up to be able to read in their synagogue. And as he reads, he reads a prophecy from Isaiah 61 about himself. Interesting choice, isn't it? Have you ever read a scripture about yourself and said, this is my scripture today? This is the one that I am living out today. I think we usually read scriptures for everybody else, right? I mean, that's what I do is I preach for all of you, not for me, right? (laughs) No, that doesn't work. I usually preach at me and figure out that, uh, okay, you guys might have the same issue as well. But I know there are people who do that. They take the Bible that way. Well, this is a book where I can use it to to get after people, and so that's what I'm going to do with it. And he uh, begins his ministry, goes back to his hometown, he finds the place, he says, this scripture is fulfilled right now, today. That's amazing to me. Now, Jesus is always relevant to what's happening and to his surroundings and to what's going on in the world, but wow, that is really close to come to someone and say, this passage is right now, today. And it makes me wonder, why don't we do that more? If that's how Jesus uses Scripture, why don't we use Scripture the same way Jesus did? Isn't that how it's supposed to be? If we're going to follow him, why don't we use it exactly like he did? Why don't you come with a passage that says, today, this is my scripture. This is the one I am fulfilling today. This is the place where I fit. And it might be a little bit easier with Jesus because of the prophecy. There are so many passages that were prophets speaking about him and about what he was going to do. And so as you look at the Gospels all the way through, we go through and we see different places where this was done in order that it might be fulfilled. And Matthew has a whole lot of those around his death. John has a whole lot more as he's writing a little bit later. This was done in order that it might be fulfilled. And they'll even tell you where it was. It's like this passage we're looking at. It's out of Isaiah 61. And he's giving you, here's exactly what this prophecy means. It was referring to Jesus as he begins his 
ministry and that he came to proclaim good news to the poor, liberty to the captive, sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed, and the year of the Lord's favor. Well, those are amazing things. Jesus fulfills a lot of prophecies. But it makes me wonder as you begin to look at Scripture and how we see Jesus being fulfilled in those if we really understand what it's all about. One of the passages we talk a lot about is found in 2 Timothy. Timothy is a young preacher. He's been trained by Paul, and Paul has brought him so that he is set up at a church now in Ephesus. And uh, after all of this training, he reminds him of what Scripture means. And so in 2 Timothy 3.14, he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus." All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Well, as Paul writes this, it hasn't always been easy for him. And there has been a lot of persecution, but Timothy is still following. And so Paul, in the background of all of his persecution, wants Timothy to stay strong, to be mature, to be where he is not going to give up or quit. And so as you look at this, he's reminding him, he says, go back to Scripture. Go back to that because that is one of the things that's most important. He says, I want you to remember from where you learned it, from your mom and your grandmother. His father's a Greek, so indications are he he didn't grow up in a Christian home. Mom was Jewish. None of them grew up in a Christian home, actually. But mom was at least Jewish, and so he says he knew the sacred writings. That means the Old Testament. So he knew about the Old Testament from the time he was little. And he was taught those things that were the law and what the law was supposed to be. And so... As you look at this and understand, he says, I want you to go back and remember that you know Scripture, that you sat in Bible class, that you learned all of these things. And Paul's saying that's a huge advantage for you to have known all of these things already because you learned them when you were very, very young. And and that's so much easier for us if we are able to learn those things when we are young. He says, I want you to remember who it was that taught you. I want you to remember that it was from childhood and that you accepted those writings as the word of God, as something that had authority, as something that would help you win battles, as something that was God speaking to you, as if it was not just a matter of saying, well, there's a book I carry, and they say, do you have your Bible? Got it. No, because theirs was a huge scroll, and it's harder to do that with. But it's something that you know and that you've understood. And then he says it's able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. Well, there's no salvation in faith in Jesus in the Old Testament, is there? Apparently there is. But it's not obvious. It didn't say, and Jesus will come and Jesus will It talks about a Messiah. It talks about the son of Abraham. It talks about the seed of Abraham who would be there and would fulfill the promise and all nations would be blessed in him. And and it does talk about that. And Jesus is the fulfillment of all those things. And he says, Timothy, you need to know that. Use that Old Testament to be able to show what faith in Christ is all about. And so that's what he's really trying to get at. You have known these sacred writings. Scripture can bring you to a place that is where you really need to be. It's about a response of faith in Jesus. It's salvation through this faith in Jesus. And I think that's one of the things that he's trying to get across because there's a whole lot of this that could be about law. 
I mean, that's the first part of it, right? In Exodus, we get the law about chapter 20 and, you know, the rest of the book's almost law and Leviticus is all law and Deuteronomy is going over the same. It's all law again and it was, here's what you should do, here's what you should not do. And Paul doesn't say to use it that way. So you're supposed to use the Bible in a way that it wasn't intended? Yes. Use it to find faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it was, the way you're supposed to use it now. You can go back and you can define all those laws because they're all in there. They're all stated in there. All of the sacred writings that he has, that's where they all are. In fact, that's going to be a major problem for the church because they're going to look at their Bible and say, we've got all these laws. And we think we probably ought to keep those because they're in the Word of God. And, you know, I brought my Bible today and it says, and you've got all these 600 laws that you're supposed to keep. How can you ignore those? He says that Old Testament was to bring you to faith in Jesus Christ because salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the application that I want you to get out of Old Testament. It was not the application many people in the early church got out of their Bible. In fact, when you go back and you look at it, the early church didn't always follow everything that was in their Bible. They were still writing the New Testament, so not everything was complete yet. Not everything was quite understood yet. So how can Scripture bring you to a place that is not what it is about? Because it is about faith. It is a way in which you're able to look at those things, and it's people of faith who are real examples who did those things of law who did those. And now that law has been taken away, he says, now you can still use those, but use them for what they're intended to be, to bring you to faith in Christ. And he gives you several things here of what Scripture is used for. And so he says there are four things it's used for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Teaching is so that you can explain some things. Here's what God is about. Here's what happened in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. So we know that that's true. We know that's the way it worked. And so in being able to understand God, we're able to say this is what he wants. This is who he is. He's he's given us some things about himself so that we're able to understand it. Reproof is about proving it again. Because you might need to know it again. You might need to say it again. Go, you might need to go back and say, yes, this is absolutely true, and I can go back and I can look at it and I can go back. But it's still, again, about understanding. Correction is about fixing misconceptions that we've had. We used to think of it this way, and now we need to understand God didn't mean that at all. He meant something else. But today, that's not so much the way it gets used. Correction is for correcting everybody else, right? So it's for teaching so I can teach you the right way and reproof is so I can use examples. And so correction is so I can correct the things that you've got wrong with you. And that's the way it gets used a lot. And I don't think that's right at all. It is not for you to read your scripture to straighten someone else out. It is for you to look at yourself and the correcting that needs to be done is in you. How many times do we read the Bible to correct us to see what's wrong with me? Now, when you've done that, you can share that with other people so that you're correcting them as well. But please don't do that before you've done it to yourself. Before you've insisted on, oh, well, you're wrong. and you're, That's the kind of the plank in the eye that Jesus talked about, to use a scripture, right? Uh, 
Don't do that. Apply that to yourself. I need to know what this says. I need to understand what this means. And I need to correct my behavior. I need to correct my thinking so that I can have this training for discipleship that I become righteous like God wanted to me, me to be. And so that's where he says, and that way it leads to people who are able to do great things for God. And we look back at the examples in the Bible of the great people of God who did these tremendous acts of faith in the New Testament as they applied what was Old Testament and now are living that out. And it's incredible some of the things that they did, some of the places that Paul went, some of the lessons that he taught, some of the suffering that he went through. Some of the miracles that they did, it's amazing to look back and say, these are really men of faith who were equipped for good work and we see their good work. My question is, do we see that today? Back to correcting again then. If we do not have men of God that are trained in righteousness, who are willing and volunteer then we don't know our scripture. Back to that again. Because you might need to look at your life and say, all right, there's some correcting that needs to be done if I am not fully equipped for every good work, fully participating in every good work. Because it is to be for people of faith, and that's what it's all about. They brought them to be people of faith who live this out as it was written on their heart. So when we see Jesus fulfilled in Scripture, he said, today this is me. I think we need to do the same thing, don't we? Today I do this Scripture. Why? Because God said so. Because I love him, because I believe in him, because he has brought me to this point of faith and he has equipped me and he has trained me to be his in righteousness so that now the Bible is not just something that I carry and go, I got mine, but it's a, I've got it. It's in here. And it's what I live. And yeah, I can open it and find it in there, but I already know it in here. And that's where Jesus is found in Scripture because he says, this one is me. And it's amazing to watch some of those things and how that all works out when you see people who really have found God. The man of God is to be this complete, mature, well-grown, equipped for every good work. And it's about maturity. All of this teaching, all of this correcting, all of this reproving is to bring about maturity in Christians, in its church. And Scripture is used just for that. It's more than just correcting error. It's for finding truth. The early church needed that. You see, they had an issue back then where the Jerusalem church was still a mess. It was still not doing what was right, and they were not following Scripture because Jesus said, go into all the world. The Isaiah passages were all the world. The promise to Abraham was All nations will be blessed in you. And for many years, they went only to Jews. And they did not follow the Scripture. And if they looked at Scripture, the correcting needed to be done in them. And so many times we hold up the Acts 2 passage and say, Oh, this was the church it should be. No, it wasn't. None of us would be allowed in that church because you are not Jewish. You would have been stopped at the door, said, uh, we don't need your kind here. Yeah. They needed to go back and look at Scripture and start the correcting process, start the reproving process, start this teaching again to say, what does God really want? God had in mind the whole world. And Jesus even told his disciples, go into all the world, and they went to Jews. That was it. So when we look at Scripture, 
Don't assume everybody else has got it right. Don't assume you've had it right all these years. And don't assume that it's all finished. Because when I grew up, it seemed to be that, well, we had all the answers. We had figured it all out. We knew everything. And we knew exactly what everything was supposed to be. And we did not have spiritual people that reflected the attitude of Christ. And I'll show you why. Jesus let Scripture define himself. And as Christians today, what I want you to do with that Bible is let it define who you are. That's how Jesus is found in Scripture. We could do the proof texting thing. So you go back to uh, Luke. I've even got a remote that lets me do that. So we're going to go back to Luke, and we're going to look at the passage. And how do we know if Jesus actually fulfills this passage? Well, it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Was the Spirit ever on Jesus? Okay, well, yeah, it came on Jesus at his baptism. So I guess he's got that one checked off. He has anointed me, okay, Spirit again, to proclaim good news to the poor. Who were the poor? Are there any poor that are actually mentioned in Scripture that he proclaimed to? Do we have any names, addresses of poor? Well, actually, there's a widow with two mites who gave away both of them, and so I guess she would be poor, so I guess that would qualify. He proclaimed liberty to the captives, so which captives did he liberate? Come on, if there's no captives he liberated, then Jesus cannot be the fulfillment of this passage, right? Because we're going to break it down and tear it apart. Recovery of sight to the blind. Do we have a name of a blind man he actually healed? Well, yeah, Bartimaeus, right? And several others, we didn't get their names, but you really ought to have name and address to be able to make sure that he did fulfill this scripture, right? I mean, he just comes in and says, I'm doing it. He said, at liberty, those who are oppressed, who were the oppressed people that he liberated? All of us. But you see what I'm talking about? If Jesus approached Scripture the way I see some people approach Scripture, we would not have any fulfillment. We would not have a picture of Jesus. Jesus comes in, he goes, this is me. This is what it's about, and here is what I'm trying to do. And sometimes we want to subdivide it so much and pick at it so much that it no longer means what it, what it was supposed to mean. Jesus let Scripture define himself, and he lives it out. It's not a book just to be followed and worshipped. We follow the man in the book. We follow the Messiah of the book. He's the main character. He's the hero. He's the one who gives life. And it describes a man of faith who comes from men of faith. And we follow that. John's disciples came and they started asking Jesus about who he was. So when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us saying, Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. They came looking for proof. How do we prove that? And Jesus basically summarizes a lot of passages about Messiah. He says, this is what Messiah is supposed to do. Look around and see what I'm doing. See if I'm living Scripture. And then he gives them, here's here's what I'm doing. Here is Scripture that I am living. I am letting Scripture define my life. This is who I am and what I'm doing. And it is all in Scripture. And I think they go back and say, yeah, it's him. Because everything in his life is a reflection of that. 
I saw this. Kindness is a language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. I think that was Jesus. Because it's not about the address of the blind man that you healed or the deaf man who can now hear. It's about the kindness of God and his grace that's being shown to other people. I'm not saying you can't use it. I'm not saying you can't be very specific with Scripture. I'm saying be careful. Because sometimes it does not lead us to the right place. And it makes us become something we never intended to be. Let me illustrate it by this Scripture. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my my disciples if you have love for one another. That's one of the things Jesus commands. To love each other, right? So he gives that to us. He says, I want you to do this. Well, who's he talking about that we have to love? Well, it's the one another. As he talks to disciples, this is not a commission to the whole world. This is what it ought to look like in church. This is among disciples. Now, there are other parables that would say, yes, go love everybody, but this one is not that. This one is to say, the world is going to know by the way you love inside of church. And of course, that has happened today. The prophecy has been fulfilled because when people think about church, they think about... Okay, no, it hasn't. They think about people who argue. They think about people who fight. They think about people who split. They think about people who fight over the littlest, tiniest detail and hate each other for it and scream and yell at each other and have all kinds of scripture against each other, right? That does not fulfill this passage. That's where we need to be. Whatever the passages say, and some of them are very specific, please don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. But when you use Scripture, the correcting that Scripture makes in your life ought to look like this, that it has produced love between brothers. And when you go to the world, some of them are just hateful and been hated for way too long and they don't know how to respond. And you may not get a good response back. But if there's ever a place where the love of God is shown, it ought to be in church. And it's actually the place where it is shown the least. And so I would not say we have fulfilled Scripture. I would not say that we have got all the answers. I would not say that we have arrived at the place where we need to be because we don't know how to do this yet. It's the main thing Jesus taught. And so what is it that we need to correct that stops us from having these kind of relationships in church. Well, it's easier outside of church, right? Because we don't expect anything out of them. And after all, you know, that's where they are and uh, we can go love them and we don't have to live with them. The people in church we have to live with. And so that's the hardest part. If you could just love people in church, yeah, that's... That's worse, isn't it? So we need teaching on how to love like that. We need reproof on who Jesus is because this was seen as who Jesus is. And the world recognizes it. The church recognizes it. Every person sees Jesus fulfilled in Scripture by love. 
why don't they see you and me that way? There's some correcting needs to be done for abusive ways and the way that we've treated people. And maybe some more training and righteousness that needs to be done. So I just want to ask you today, do you have a scripture? Do you have a place where it talks about you? I was going to throw this in, but we're out of time. Okay, well. When Ken goes over to Thailand, there's a place where it says Paul went back and strengthened the churches. I think that's Ken fulfilling that scripture. Okay? So, yeah, it works. Mine's Colossians, the end of Colossians 1. I want to present every man mature in Christ, everyone full-grown, complete. So if you want mine, that's mine. That's my main goal. That's the scripture I want to see fulfilled the most. So can we find a place in there where it talks about us? Surely there ought to be some place in there where it talks about us. If we're really Christians, really following, there ought to be some place where we can say, I've done this, I've fulfilled this, and actually there's a whole lot of places. Salvation's found in no one else under heaven except Jesus. And we can find some places, but not near enough. We can find some places where forgiveness is offered because of a repentance and baptism that was done. And yes, repentance and baptism are very specific. And so you're able to say, yes, I fulfilled that. And the blood of Jesus was applied to me. And the grace of God came into my life. And because of faith, I've been allowed into this grace of God. And I've been shown not guilty by the grace of God. And we are rejoicing at the prodigal's party. That's what Sunday morning's about right? Isn't that how we're supposed to be? Or do we come in all grouchy and kind of like, I don't like those people over there. (sighs) Sorry, that's kind of a there. (laughs) Because if I pointed at one person, (laughs) that's what it is. Jesus found himself in scripture. And we look like him when we are found in scripture. So are we the fulfillment of Scripture? Is our church the fulfillment of what God intended? Jerusalem was not. Can we be better than Jerusalem because we are fulfilling more of Scripture? And when we read in the New Testament, I want people to say, that sounds like your church. That sounds like your people. So what does it take for you to be fulfillment of Scripture today? It might be some specifics, like I need to repent, I need to be baptized, I need to confess, I need to have some sins forgiven. So have you found Jesus in Scripture? The response to finding Jesus in Scripture is that you'll believe. That I believe this, and I find myself here. We'll talk about another one next week. For this week, just find yourself there. And if you haven't, and you know there's something wrong, boy, let us help. We're here for that reason. Would you come while we stand and sing?